uh, let's first of all have a, a general uh, view of our topic today uh, on global cooperation, uh, bringing to a clearer understanding of what global cooperation is and why it is necessary uh, to maintain such in order to fast track uh, maybe uh, economic uh, development around the world. Um, well, <laughs> when we talk about global uh, cooperation, if we want to mean uh, cooperation between different actors around the globe, it's one thing. But when we talk about global cooperation under, um, let's say, um, under the command of a, of a certain group that just pulls the strings, um, it's a different thing. And here, the key point is sovereignty. You cannot be talking about any real global cooperation when the actors in this process are not sovereign enough to make their own decisions on how they want to trade, how they want to build economic relations, how they want to build their security architecture, how they want to structure their lives, which kind of values they want to uh, maintain in, in their countries or spread around. And those fundamental issues like, um, you know, values, security, um, uh, economic principles, and sovereignty as an ability to make own decisions on that are key for uh, real global cooperation. Because otherwise, we will continue seeing um, a scenario developing when you have a certain group of uh, people, the so-called, um, you know, global elites, or it's, well, basically an international group of major um, capital holders, let's say the ones running uh, the biggest companies, etc. So it's not even, um, you know, located geographically somewhere in one place, but again, it's a network. But when you see this group um, uh, pulling the strings and saying, okay, you know, like some time ago it happened, let's move the production to China. Let's not pass the technologies to them. Let's, uh, let's uh, you know, just pass uh, the tasks on, on what is supposed to be uh, produced and in which uh, quantity. And then we will be setting prices for that. We will be putting our labels for that and we will be making our billions on that. So that's how it's been working, um, you know, in terms of, you know, production of the majority of the goods uh, the customers are enjoying um, all over the world. So to have uh, a, an actual global cooperation in the first place, uh, what you need to have is sovereignty. Once you have sovereignty, you can come to that open global market and say, all right, here is what I have. You know, I have natural resources. I have human capital. I have great creative specialists. And, you know, let's see how we can exchange that to what we need, right? Not to mention other possible um, scenarios where we can have, where we can recognize uh, some of the rights of each uh, human being, each citizen of this planet for the resources that the planet has. Because with the technology we have right now and with the, uh, hopefully with the understanding we have right now, we can realize that, you know, nation states and borders are quite an artificial uh, concept. So. Uh, to a certain extent, each individual on this planet is supposed to be able to enjoy the, uh, uh, you know, the, the resources that are available. But that's uh, a different conversation. I don't think that would be possible in the upcoming future. Um, but in any case, when we talk about global cooperation, again, uh, the key point here is sovereignty. Otherwise, it will be global domination versus global uh, um, um, you know, support of that system, if that's vocal or not, but if uh, you have um, actors being a part of that system, it means that they support it either silently or by um, their um, actions. How can we uh, uh, change the narratives or reverse this to make sure uh, that the world at large benefits, uh, like we uh, said, from the resources, from the endowment, uh, and of course from this win-win uh, cooperation that is existing among nations? You know, um, when you dive into um, analysis of the current geopolitical events, you can almost drown with the amount of information that is available right now, right? There is so much being said, so much being discussed, so many fakes uh, circulating around. And, you know, when you try to investigate um, and when you actually follow the news, you get informed 
or um, well, if you follow the news, you get disinformed by one side or another in, in the most cases, right? If you don't follow the news, you're not even informed. And it's very hard to navigate through, you know, this ocean of information that we're seeing, especially when you talk about um, different political leaders. And um, the trick over here is also that in many cases, one uh, one little fact would be pulled out to prove that a specific political leader is, you know, let's say, absolute uh, evil or the absolute good, just based on, you know, some small facts taken out of the context. The point that I'm trying to make here is that what is necessary to analyze uh, if you want to, uh, you know, navigate through uh, this um, amount of information and fakes and, and interpretations and everything, is to see the strategies that are being uh, not just discussed, but actually implemented and the values that underlie those strategies. Because, all right, I, uh, I'm, I'm gonna express my personal opinion right now and you know that one could agree or disagree with that. Um, yet, I think there should be uh, you know, um, some rational limits put on uh, things that are being promoted in many cases under the flag of freedom and democracy. And when you see the extremes to which some of the liberal communities go, when everything is confusing, I mean, you don't even know how to address a person unless he puts a small page on, on him or her or whatever else itself, you know? And uh, in my opinion, this is crazy, but to be able to distinguish uh, which side you want to somehow support or where you want to uh, give your own um, energy and you know resources and everything else is to see, is it generally speaking for the evolution? Is it for something constructive? Is it for life itself or is it not, right? Because when you see um, this kind of conflicts uh, that we're facing right now, basically it's a conflict between uh, postmodernism and uh, this one has been this side has been represented by uh, liberal democracies and their uh, you know extreme avant-garde i would say that is very confused about uh, its own gender its own uh, you know values its own um, ability or desire to even live on this planet because what you see happening is you know legalization of euthanasia for everyone now it's being discussed that poor people could also have the right to leave this um, you know life uh, upon uh, their own decision there is in my opinion but again this is just my personal opinion too much confusion in that on the other side you have traditionalism and the danger over here as well is that when you have too much pressure coming from one side, let's say from the postmodernists, the traditionalists would be going, you know, deeper to fundamentals, which is also an extreme that is definitely not good for anyone. But the balance point here is always shifting because as years go by, and now it's happening very fast, through the window of Overton, we find ourselves accepting more and more of things that we used to consider, we as humanity used to consider nonsense for many centuries, if not, you know, thousands of years. So when when we follow, um, you know, the, the, the narratives, when we um, try to navigate through the narratives, I think the key decision that we need to make is what we stand for. And we need to uh, be able to be vocal about it because right now, uh, you know, I feel like in some communities, uh, it's not even comfortable to say that you uh, believe in two genders <laughs> and not more than that. Like, why not four? You know, people would ask you, but it's not even comfortable and you need to excuse yourself if you want to say something like that. And that as well <laughs> is a nonsense. So now we're seeing more and more discussions of, all right, you know, let's uh, start accepting this and that and whatsoever and erase all the uh, borders. And basically it's it's the narrative that we see promoted right now by the postmodernist society goes against the laws. I don't want to talk about religious issues now, but against the laws of the universe, because I mean, it was not us who created the uh, the universe and it has been working in a certain way for you know, millions of years. So who are we with our limited knowledge and, you know, with lettuce overliving some of our political uh, leaders, who are we to get into 
uh, those core issues like trying to get and change get into and change the dna trying to play games you know with um, our bodies at this uh, you know genetic level trying to play with our minds at those crazy levels when the key objective is to get people as confused as possible when you don't even know what you are and what you're doing so to change the narrative uh, responding your question you know uh, briefly and concluding um i think that to change the narrative we need to first look into our own selves and it's it's something we need to decide not with the brain because it plays plays too many mind games right now but we need to look into our hearts and see what do we need to do to live the life to evolve and to pass our knowledge on to the next generation one one way or another because that's that's the key objective of uh, you know the uh, the life itself that's how evolution has been working so you know if something is is um about dividing conquering if something is about destruction and self-destruction and degradation moral degradation uh, degradation of values then i think it is doomed to die off but while it's dying uh it might take a lot of people with it and this is exactly what we see happening right now Afrique Media.